Everybody. Um, my name is Eric Erlinson and I'm a software engineer at Red Hat and I uh, thank you very much for attending uh, my Ray Summit talk of Powering Open Data Hub with Ray. Another possible title for this talk uh, is more direct with some of you to say using Jupyter and Ray in the cloud. So the basic organization of the talk is going to be I'm going to talk about uh, why you might actually be interested in using um, Jupyter with Ray, and then I'm going to try to put Open Data Hub uh, and Jupyter uh, in some context for you. Um, I'm going to talk about the architecture of Ray uh, working with Open Data Hub, and then demonstrate uh, demonstrate this deployment in action, and then last I'll conclude with uh, some of the uh, community collaborations that uh, helped make this possible. Uh, so to put to understand the motivations, I want you to consider like the actual Ray library ecosystem. I mean, out of the box, Ray has native support for hyperparameter tuning, reinforcement learning, distributed training, and you know, scale out uh, serving for models. Um, there are also community integrations for all of the very popular uh, machine learning packages and data science packages, including the like XGBoost, Dask, Horvod, TensorFlow, SKLearn. There's a very long list you can see at the link at the bottom. Uh, but the, the main thing I want to bring to your attention is that um, all of these libraries have already been used by data scientists using Jupyter for quite a while. And so it makes a lot of sense <clears throat> to consider whether or not you could say, well, what if we take Ray <clears throat> with all of its integrations of these packages and also use it as backing compute for the same libraries from a Jupyter interface to give you the full power of Jupyter's interactive and literate programming uh, experience. And uh, <clears throat> today specifically also I'll be talking about using these tools as hosted using cloud platforms, and in my case, um, I'll be talking about cloud platforms with Kubernetes and OpenShift. So when I first began this investigation, um, of course, the current <coughs> version of the Ray library is Ray 1.x, and Ray 1.x had a uh, architectural requirement that if you want to connect to the Ray cluster, you had to do it while you were on the physical node that the Ray head was running on. Um, and so this means that if you wanted to use Jupyter with Ray, you would actually have to run some kind of pod or container where Jupyter and the Ray head node were running simultaneously on the same pod. Now, if you get this to work at all, um, it's not actually a great cloud architecture because of course it violates a good you know, separation of concerns where different components are running inside their own separate pods. However, by the time I began looking into this issue, <clears throat> of course, uh, development of the upcoming Ray 2.0 was already well underway, and Ray 2.0 um, <clears throat> is being redesigned to support a true client-server connection between clients and the Ray head. And of course, this is a total game changer because it allows the Jupyter pod to run independently <clears throat> as it already does in most environments and simply connect to the Ray head which is running in its own separate pods and talking to the Ray workers. And so this is a much cleaner architecture, much easier to get working. So when I talk about consuming Jupyter, um, the way I actually implemented this is to use Jupyter as provided by the Open Data Hub project. And so I want to talk a little bit about what that means and uh, why it helped. So <clears throat> there's different ways to describe ODH. Um, the first might be is that it's an open source downstream and specifically it's a uh, downstream of the Kubeflow project. Um, and so this is a very typical pattern at Red Hat where we take a popular open source upstream and repackage a slight variation of it and contribute most of the development back to the upstream. 
Um, Open Data Hub is also a reference platform. Um, it's been used as a sort of proof of concept that um, popular machine learning tools <clears throat> that operate in the cloud can all work together to uh, support you know, integrated data science workflows. Now it's also fairly federated and by that I mean it's the integrations are fairly loose and of course they're all running in the cloud and that means that it's easy to mix and match the tools, install them in an a la carte sort of basis. Um, it also means that it's very easy, of course, to simply spin up other tools that you want to work with. So obviously this property made it uh, extra easy to, you know, consider adding a tool like Ray into the mix. Um, lastly, Open Data Hub is a, what we call a meta operator. And what that means is you can consume ODH from something like Red Hat's OpenShift Operator Hub. Um, and the operator will in turn install other operators, like for instance, uh, the Kafka Sturmz operator or the Apache Spark operator or Prometheus. And so again, you're getting, um, you know, a la carte menu style access to uh, different tools um, through a single meta operator experience. So well, what's it actually like to do data science with ODH? Um, the tools in ODH provide fairly good coverage for a typical machine learning uh, workflow um, where you, you know, go all the way from setting business goals to data preparation to model training and then finally to actual application development and deployment. Um, and of course, this is not a waterfall process. So all these um, steps iterate uh, against each other. Um, it supplies tooling for most of the, you know, data science persona that you'd encounter um, everywhere from business stakeholders through data engineering and uh, the actual data scientists doing model development and the application and IT um, staff that do, you know, development and deployment. Um, you can see here a bunch of the uh, tools that you can get through Open Data Hub or Kubeflow. Um, and how they map onto the different uh, stages and uh, data personas. Uh, so at Red Hat, uh, we don't just uh, advocate using tools like Open Data Hub. Uh, we actually use Open Data Hub internally. Um, we've used it to provide data science support for things like uh, application log, monitoring, and anomaly detection. Um, you know, cluster metric analysis, um, and also analysis of the data coming back from uh, customer uh, support interactions. So to help you understand um, architecturally where I went with this, it helps to do an analogy. Um, you know, Open Data Hub already supports using Apache Spark as backing compute for Jupyter, and it works like this. If you log into the uh, Jupyter Hub launcher from Open Data Hub. It will, of course, as the standard uh, launcher does, spin you up a Jupyter environment where you can create your notebooks. But in the background, um, it's also referring to a uh, data structure, uh, which is called a single user profile, which knows how to tell it how to spin up Spark clusters. Um, and part of how it does that is it talks to um, service template objects, which basically explain to it how to, you know, what, what actual Kubernetes objects it needs to create to uh, stand up a service. And so it uses that. Um, we have it set for how to, you know, spin up Spark clusters with workers and executors. And so by the time you have your Jupyter environment up, you have an also a dedicated Spark cluster for you to use that you can connect to from Jupyter. Now, looking at the single user profile and service template, um, there's absolutely nothing exotic about this. They're just Kubernetes config map objects, and so it's just data-driven configuration. Um, and so there's nothing specific to standing up a Spark cluster, and so it obviously brings up the questions, well, could I create these objects and tell it how to spin up a Ray cluster, um, especially using the new Ray 2.0 with client server capabilities. 
And a uh, spoiler, of course, it is possible to do this. Um, here's a fragment of the Ray single user profile. Uh, you can see, again, there is nothing exotic here. It's the typical stuff you see in uh, Kubernetes objects and data about what kind of images to use, um, what kind of resources to request, um, you know, some environment variables you can return to help you connect to the cluster that it creates. And of course, there's a pointer to this Ray cluster service template object. Um, and so here is what that looks like. Again, it's nothing but some data, you know, held in a config map. Um, and it, you know, describes metadata, like how to name the cluster for the user. It describes how many workers to allow. Um, the full specification for a Ray cluster object is quite long, if you ever see it, so I'm not going to show the whole thing. But um, again, there's nothing special about this. You can just <clears throat> use, you know, the Ray cluster object, stick it in this uh, service template config map, and uh, ODH understands how to work with it. Um, so now that I've described the architecture, I want to actually uh, demo for you what this looks like. So <clears throat> here I've brought up um, a uh, window into the actual OpenShift cluster that uh, my deployment is running on. And you can see that after I logged in to the Jupyter Hub launcher, um, if I look at the pods it created for me, there is a Jupyter Hub pod with allows me to run notebooks. And then down here, you can see that it actually created a um, Ray cluster head node. Um, and so my Jupyter can connect to this node. Um, and also, if I look at a different slice through these pods, you can see that, uh, again, it shows my Ray cluster. And at the bottom here, it's also running the Ray operator. And of course, the Ray operator is what actually spins my Ray clusters for me and auto scales them. And so now I'm going to switch over um, and show you what this looks like to run in an actual Jupyter notebook. So here we are in a uh, Jupyter notebook, and we're going to see what it looks like to uh, have a Jupyter notebook where you can access the full power of uh, Ray cluster computing. Um, so for my demo today, in the interest of uh, simplicity and also in honor of the shared um, heritage of both Ray and Apache Spark, I thought I would show what it's like to uh, write a simple version of the uh, classic Spark Pi uh, demonstration using Ray. Um, so of course, Ray Pi is like the Spark Pi Monte Carlo estimate of the value of Pi um, using parallel computing. And so again, these images I deployed uh, all have the Ray libraries pre-installed, and so I can just uh, import these. Um, and then once I import them, I can connect directly to my Ray cluster. You can see that uh, it has provided me this Ray cluster environment variable so that I don't have to know the name of the cluster it created for me. I just connect using the environment variable. Um, you can also see that we're in a notebook environment, and as you know, notebook cells can be executed in any order or sometimes re-executed. And so you can see here, instead of just connecting directly, I first test to see if I've already connected. Uh, that's a nice little idiom to use uh, if you're actually doing Ray uh, inside a notebook. And so now I've got my connection. Um, and because, of course, we're in notebooks, I can use literate programming to help explain what it is I'm actually thinking about doing. And so here's a diagram that shows what it's like to do uh, a Monte Carlo estimation of pi. You just generate a bunch of random points on the unit square, and you count how many of those points actually landed inside the corresponding circle, which are the red points, versus outside. Um, which are the black points. And once you have these uh, two counts, it's an easy formula to apply. You simply take the number of points that are inside the circle, multiply it by four, and divide it by the total number of points you generated. Um, and there you have an estimate of pi that converges, although very slowly. Um, so if you've ever used Apache Spark, you know that it, doing this computation looks a lot like the thing you see here, which is you take some seed data, 
and you have to parallelize it over the network um, and ship it off to Spark executors. And at that point, you can just run filters. So you can say, okay, I take my C data, map it into randomized data, filter it to make sure that I get the count of things that's inside the circle. And lastly, I return the count of those items and then apply my formula, as you see. Um, now, it turns out in Ray, uh, which has a more general compute model, I don't actually have to create seed data. I can just tell Ray, it's like, here's a function. I'll tag it with Ray Remote, as you see in this cell. And I just tell it to use a Python generator at the point of computation to generate my random data directly, and then count it. So I never actually have to ship data over the network. The only thing I have to bring back is a single integer count of the number of points. And so this is actually a more efficient and direct way to uh, do the same thing we used to do in Spark. So I'll simply tell Jupyter how to define this function. Um, and we can see what it looks like to call it. So if I simply call this function using the dot remote that Ray added for me, you can see it doesn't return a result because of course Ray's compute model is lazy. All it returned for me was like a placeholder for a computation. So to actually run the computation, of course, use ray.get. If I do that and I print out the corresponding estimate of pi, I get it very quickly, of course, because I only used a thousand points. And as you can see, the estimate is, as expected, fairly terrible, but it is an estimate. Uh, so, of course, the real point of using platforms like Ray is to <clears throat> do more parallelized computing. So it's easy to do. I just call a bunch of invocations of my count in circle function and send them off to Ray, and Ray does its job parallelizing. And so if I run this, I get a parallelized version of the estimate of pi using many more points, but getting Ray to parallelize the computation for me. You can see it returns in about 10 seconds, and as expected, the estimate for pi is actually a little bit better. It's at least down to 3.14. Uh, so each of these parts we computed can be viewed as its own estimate. So I can actually use the power of uh, Jupyter here to simply display the individual values right in line. And you can see that they're all similar, but they're not the same. Um, and again, using Using Jupyter, it's easy to run plotting libraries, so I'll just use a classic uh, PyPlot and uh, <clears throat> run a computation and plot the results. Now you can see here again, this is the power of uh, doing Ray of Jupyter. I'm actually calling, calling out to do computations right in the same cell that I'm doing plots, um, and I get the results immediately. And we can see there's a little variation here, but the scale of the plot it doesn't tell me very much about what's going on. And so I'm going to iterate on my plot. I'm just going to zoom in on my y-axis. And also I'm going to add a little dotted line to show me where the actual value of pi is to uh, compare with. And we see that right away we get a result. And um, we see the variation, you know, relatively narrow variation. But now I can replot to uh, accentuate it and compare it to the true value of pi. Now, you know, obviously, the, the true story here is not that you can use Ray to do a highly over-engineered and really terrible estimate for the value of pi. The story, of course, is that I can do data science investigations using Ray to speed up all my computations, but also have the full power of literate programming and interactive plotting um, and interactive you know, software development that you get by doing data science using Jupyter. So the demo that I just showed you um, was deployed and run on the uh, Massachusetts Open Cloud. Um, now the Mass Open Cloud um, is run by in partnership between Boston University and Red Hat. It also includes a uh, large consortium of other affiliated universities and um, alliance between other industry partners. Um, so as I deployed it currently, you uh, there are certain limitations um, for this uh, sort of case study deployment. Um, 
The first is that I cap the number of uh, workers you can get at five, and so you can get one head plus five workers. Um, each of these um, nodes gets a single CPU and one gigabyte of memory. Um, it comes pre-installed uh, with uh, the following packages. There are popular packages for machine learning that you see here. Um, so if you want to use this to test drive it, I encourage you to do it. Um, you know, it will be good for small to medium size uh, experiments. It will not scale to very large scale stuff that you can possibly do with Ray. Um, if people are interested in extending the resources, I encourage you to reach out to me. We can uh, redeploy uh, with larger resources. It just requires some negotiation. Um, I also did this deployment um, using another Red Hat uh, program called Operate First. Um, and the mandate for Operate First is um, basically to extend the concept of developing software in the open, which of course has become popular now for quite a while, to actually operating the software and the services in the open. And so um, you won't be surprised to know that this idea has a fairly strong uh, GitOps style component. And so here uh, is actually a, a little screenshot of the, the different pull requests that I created to uh, do the deployment that you just saw. Um, and again, this is all in the open up on GitHub. You can actually look at this um, issue and the pull request at the link down you see at the bottom. Um, so it's actually a fairly powerful uh, case study in actually maintaining and upgrading and operating a, a full-fledged cluster plus a data science environment um, completely in the open and hosted using Git as the source of truth for the uh, cluster deployments. Um, while I was doing this work, I was also supported um, with a collaboration through IBM. Um, IBM has been doing a lot of work in the Ray space, including uh, supporting Ray on their IBM code engine. Um, you know, doing running Ray on IBM internal OpenShift clusters, um, supporting scikit-learn pipelines where the pipelines are actually run under the hood by Ray for parallelism, um, and also several use cases in the machine learning model space, uh, including some interesting um, use cases around Earth science. Um, and if you're interested in any of uh, the activities of IBM Ray, I definitely encourage you to go check out uh, um, two talks at, also at Ray Summit. Um, the first is by Raghu Ganti, uh, Scaling and Unifying SKLearn Pipelines um, Using Ray. And uh, Lin Song Chu, who will be uh, talking about uh, doing uh, serverless earth science data labeling, uh, also using Ray. So what's coming up in the future? Um, some things on the roadmap we want to get working are taking um, the Ray upstream operator and providing it through um, the operator hub catalog as a community operator. Um, we want to uh, eventually maintain the Ray images I created via Red Hat's project Toth, which is um, exploring the use of machine learning models um, to maintain images um, that are tuned for hardware and also tuned for library compatibilities and keeping libraries current. Uh, I want to hopefully encourage people to do more case studies uh, using Jupyter with Ray, um, possibly using the deployment I created up on the Massachusetts Open Cloud. Um, hopefully, if there's enough community uptake, we can do some formal integration of Ray with Kubeflow and uh, Open Data Hub and I also would love to explore uh, Kubeflow pipeline nodes where a compute is also backed by Ray. So again, thanks very much for attending my talk. Um, if you're interested in what you saw, um, please feel free to play with the uh, demo environment I showed you earlier. Um, the links at the bottom will show you how to actually get onto the cluster and uh, see the instructions for bringing up my demo. Um, anybody with a Google account can log in. Um, also, if you find problems or want to extend the capabilities I've employed, you can file issues and pull requests with the Operate First environment or reach out to me and convince me to uh, 
file them for you. And overall, uh, please report back to me. I'm eager to hear how people uh, experience uh, this deployment. Thanks very much.